All right, good morning, everyone. This is Sunny Lou Williams with you this morning. Today, we are going to be covering webinar number three in the Cultural uh, Linguistic Competency Project webinar series with a focus on institutional racism in healthcare. As a reminder, the Cultural Linguistic Competency Project is brought to you by the Family Social Services Administration Division of Mental Health and Addiction in the state of Indiana. And this particular project has been going on since 1996 with the focus of providing training services and technical assistance for community mental health centers and addiction providers throughout the Indiana. Training services are designed to improve organizational effectiveness and efficiency in providing culturally competent services. And specifically this topic, institutional racism in healthcare, was actually the number one voted topic of interest when surveyed amongst our community mental health center and addiction provider organizations. So we're very glad that everyone could join us today to hear from our speaker, Dr. Christopher King. In addition to that, I wanted to make sure that we restated our vision and mission, our vision being um, for cultural linguistic competency and health disparities, vision of persons of all cultures and ethnicities partnering with local and state systems to achieve equity and access services, interventions, and outcomes in our systems. And the mission to facilitate cultural and linguistic competency strategies throughout Indiana state and local systems to improve outcomes for populations vulnerable to disparities and disproportionalities. This morning, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Dr. Christopher King. Dr. King is a phenomenal individual and a national thought leader dedicated to transforming healthcare through research and education. Dr. King is the Associate Professor and Chair of Health and Systems Administration at Georgetown University Medical Center. And he will be providing us um, some key insights on institutional racism in healthcare, gleaning from history, policy, today's context, application, and even measurement and uh, data-driven science tools for our organizations to apply when looking at implicit bias and also specifically measuring um, the amount of institutional driven processes that skew towards that bias or skew towards prejudice or in some cases uh, skew specifically towards uh, racism leanings. Dr. King is incredibly well accoladed. He is the associate professor and teaches and contributes to scholarship on the creation of equitable systems of care within the context of national health reform goals. Prior to joining Georgetown University, Christopher, or rather Dr. King, served as the first assistant vice president of community health for MedStar Health, a $6 billion not-for-profit healthcare system comprised of 10 hospitals in the Baltimore, Washington region. He has specifically a heart for bridging the gap between medical care and public health with a focus on contributing to community-based planning, implementation, and evaluation with several of the following positions contributing to national case studies and publications. Dr. King was the director of a federally qualified health center in Southern Maryland, former chairman of the Consumer Health Foundation Board of Directors, fellow at the American College of Execu Healthcare Executives, and served as the Washington DC Department of Health State Innovation Model. He is also currently serving as the commissioner for the District of Columbia Commission on Health Equity, and he is the Senior Fellow of the Health Research and Educational Trust. What led this project to um, invite Dr. King today to present um, on institutional racism in healthcare is among one, one among many, many of his publications is the specific um, article that is embedded within the go-to training resource under materials, the healthcare institution, population and black lives. That is an article that is specifically uploaded to the GoTo training. It will also be available post uh, today's presentation as well as part of the educational resource and materials um, available from the Cultural Linguistic Competency Project. Well, I've certainly taken an, up enough time with um, background and information. I'd love to transition over and welcome Dr. Christopher King to uh, present to us today. Dr. King? I appreciate that. It's, uh, it's so great to be with you this morning. And I just personally want to commend the state of Indiana 
for delving into this work. I know it's not easy, but it is certainly key to improving the health and future productivity of the nation. And just a side note, speaking of Indiana, I must share that I do have ties to Evansville, this, that southern tip of the state, as I grew up in a small town not too far from Henderson, Kentucky. Some of you may have heard of Morganfield. For the past 25 years, my career has focused on health disparities, as, as Sonny has shared with you. And early in my career, my focus was more on the ground, serving as an administrator and program developer for direct services that targeted vulnerable and underserved populations. And as I have evolved in my work and pursued my PhD, my work has focused on more upstream factors with the underlying research question, what does it really take to eradicate racial differences in health outcomes? And here I've provided a partial list of how me and many of my colleagues and collaborators are advancing knowledge and practice in this space. The publication on the left is the publication that Sunny was just referring to. It contextualizes the Black Lives Matter movement in the healthcare space. Here I've laid out some of the objectives for this talk. Uh, the goal is to review the evolution of medical care with a focus on race, reflect on systemic policies that led to structural differences in communities. We're going to explore institutional norms that perpetuate racialized beliefs and current practice. I'll also provide some examples to corroborate the importance of normalizing context over race. And finally, I'll share examples of how practitioners and institutions are advancing this work. I'll include resources that I think will be helpful as you pursue your own journey in this space. Before I go any further, I do want to let you know that this slide deck is interactive and it's embedded with a plethora of resources and links to primary sources. So I have a warm up for us. To kick us off, let's take a quiz. Um, I have eight questions. So I want to give you a moment. If you could just, if you have a piece of paper, if you could mark one through eight, you can use your mobile device if that's easy for you. Um, and I'm going to give you about 90 seconds to answer eight questions. They're multiple choice. Okay, here we go. Here are your questions, and let me play a tune that I think will stimulate some of your thinking, a tune we're all so familiar with. About 30 more seconds. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that. All right, here are the answers. Number one is B, two is D as in David, three is E as in everybody, four is G as in go-getter, five is C as in Christopher, six F, seven H, and eight is A, and this view may be easier for you. Give you a moment to process this. So you'll see we define health disparity as measurable differences in health outcomes by population. Eotrophobia is the fear of the medical institution or the healer. Number three, epigenetics, the study of how environmental factors affect phenotype expression. Number four, inclusion is equal distribution of power so all racial groups can be full participants. Number five, systemic racism, when public policies, institutional practices, cultural representations, 
and other norms reinforce racial inequity. Race is a social construct. Number seven, diversity, heterogeneous identity characteristics, and racial equity is when an outcome cannot be predicted by race. As I go through this talk, I will delve deeper into each one of these terms and concepts. If you haven't heard uh, the term woke, it has been coined by millennials who define it as being alert and aware of injustice in society, particularly racial justice. So I ask you, what are your thoughts? Are we as professionals woke? Are we as healthcare administrators and or practitioners aware of how racial injustice even today affects the mental health and well-being of the patients we serve? Have we taken time to explore the impact we can make in our communities? Do we display courage and speak up when we see injustice happening in real time? And what about the healthcare sector? How are we doing? Well, I will argue that we have come a long way. These are just a few recent articles found in just some prominent publications recently. They include healthcare magazines, medical school and professional association journals, and newspapers. Even among those of us who specialize in this work, we are seeing an uptick. We're seeing more and more of an appetite for these types of conversations and interventions. Industry leaders are recognizing that racism hinders their ability to close the gap in health disparities. It compromises their population health objectives. And as we think about value-based payment models, it even impacts the bottom line. So in doing this work, I understand why black and brown people have and continue to be disproportionately burdened by poorer health outcomes than whites, even when we control for socioeconomic factors such as income, insurance, and education. And this outcome is due to historically rooted systems and policies and practices that impact health and well being. So, if these policies and practices put us here, I believe that new policies and practices can undo the damage. So, it's critical that we apply a racial equity lens and, and how we do our work and how we navigate the world. And a racial equity lens, as you see in this red box, can be defined as analyzing policies, practices, and norms that disproportionately burden a racial group. So with that definition, let's take a moment and go back in time and reflect on the evolution of medicine and key milestones in our history. I show this timeline to put things in context. The first enslaved Africans were brought to this country in 1523, and slavery was legal through 1865. By policy, segregation ended in 1954. So I think you know where I'm going, right? It's now 2020. So out of 494 years, slavery and segregation were systemically institutionalized for 428 of those years, or 86% of the time period. My friends, it's going to take a long time to undo this damage. And given what we know about intergenerational trauma, stress, epigenetics, bias, and discrimination, health disparities should not surprise us. Thousands of Africans were torn from family, sold for labor, physically abused, and perceived as genetically inferior. And what about their orientation to medical care? Slaves were property. When they were sick, they needed medical care from a physician community that engaged in uncivilized, unethical experimental practices. As a people, this was their orientation to the American medical community. The effect of this legacy, it shows up today. It shows up in how care is delivered, and it shows up in how many people of color perceive the healthcare system. If you haven't heard of him, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. James Sims, held in medical textbooks as the father of gynecology, as he perfected the technique to treat vaginal fistulas. He was erected in 1938 in Central Park. But what has been lost in history are the narratives of Anarka, Betsy, and Lucy, who suffered from vaginal fistulas. They were slaves. In an effort to perfect his treatment protocol, Dr. Sims exposed these three women and others to painful experimental procedures with no anesthesia. According to documentation and literature, 
Anarka, who you see with the red bandana, was exposed to close to 30 procedures. Now, in our pursuit to correct injustice as a nation and promote racial healing, I think we're all aware of the removal of statues that symbolize pain and hurt. These are just a few photos of Confederate officers who have been held as heroes in U.S. history. Well, Dr. Sims is not immune. In fact, due to public outcry, his statue was removed from Central Park in 2018. We've all heard about maternal mortality in Black women. There's been so much dialogue about causal factors. But one thing we do know is that we can credit James Sims and his influence in how the gynecological community has been implicitly and explicitly trained to treat Black women. Those vestiges remain today, and they contribute to the maternal mortality trends that we're seeing in Black women. In this slide, I share just a few medical fallacies of how Blacks were perceived by the medical community. Uh, in comparison to whites, uh, they were perceived to have thicker skin, faster blood coagulation, uh, having a higher pain tolerance, being predisposed to violence, having smaller brains, and less respiratory capacity. These beliefs were institutionalized in the evolution of medicine in America. Even medical students today think Black uh, patients feel less pain than whites in addition to pain. And as just as recent as 2016, Hoffman and her colleagues found that some medical students think there are differences between blood coagulation and skin thickness in Blacks when compared with whites. Now, because of the conditions during slavery and to foster this sense of hope and encouragement in the community, there was prayer. Physicians did not have the best interests of slaves at heart, so distrust was the norm. Instead, you just pray for the best because the man will not help you. We see this attitude in practice today, particularly around barriers to mental health services and medication adoption. Many people of color continue to rely on prayer to fix the issue. Let's go to 19, uh, uh, 1865, where slavery was abolished. So we have freed Blacks who still need medical care, but the system was riddled with white physicians who perceived Blacks as an intellectually inferior and physiologically different. Many of those narratives remain unheard. And while Jim Crow laws of the 1870s espouse separate but equal, we know that the quality and the services and the structural conditions of communities of color were vastly different. These laws set us back and restricted access to opportunity, which begs us to appreciate this distinction between equity and equality, which tend to be conflated. When all people are not given a fair shot and those trends have, have persisted for 400 years, it's important for us to apply an equity lens as a means of resolving the issue, which requires us to examine our communities and our populations and distribute resources according to need. As you can see in this illustration, equality is when all of the characters have the same size box to stand on, but they're at different heights, right? And so that would make sense because they all don't have full access to the apples on the apple tree, which is a metaphor for uh, opportunity. And then on the right, you'll see an adjustment. You see that the sizes of the boxes are adjusted according to need so that all actors here have full access to opportunity. Now, I don't wanna overlook the fact that black medical students were being trained during this time period. In fact, there were seven African-American medical schools in the early 1900s. However, during this time and in the spirit of quality, Abraham Flexner was charged to audit medical schools and make recommendations to close schools that, not, that did not meet quality standards. These, these, the, his examination was not just restricted to um, African-American schools. He uh, looked at 115 medical schools across the nation. Out of his work, it was recommended that five of seven African-American schools, med schools close, leaving two, Meharry in Tennessee and Howard University, which is not too far from where I am right now. The closure of these schools decreased the number of African-American matriculates, right? Uh, this also hurt the country because black doctors, we know that black doctors are more likely to serve 
black communities and low-income communities. And we've heard about the Tuskegee study of 19, in, 19, in the early 1900s, which is prominently cited in the literature. It's prominently cited because it was federally supported, um, it was a federally supported investigation. And in 1951, unbeknownst to her, Henrietta Lacks immortalized cells helped uncover treatments for cancer, HIV AIDS, polio, and they also informed the Human Genome Project. I share these milestones to reinforce the magnitude and pervasiveness of how people of color have historically experienced the healthcare delivery system. This helps us understand why there's distrust and there may be a lack of engagement, right? We're seeing this in practice today. It's 2020, right? Uh, knowing this history provides clues on what can be done to rectify the problem. And as we think about the racial wealth divide, we must not forget the impact of redlining, which was born out of Roosevelt's New Deal. While redlining deprived people of color of wealth, of wealth creation, it also led to high concentrations of poverty, social ills, and mental health conditions. Again, we see these trends in historically marginalized communities today. In fact, segregation is a public health measure, and there is a residential segregation index. The residential segregation index refers to the degree in which two or more groups live separately from one another. A value of zero represents a community that is completely integrated, and a value of 100 represents a community that, community that is completely segregated. So let's see if this works today. I am going to take you to the website where you can, we're gonna pull up counties in the state of Indiana so that you can see how racially segregated those counties are. This link takes you directly to the source, which is county health rankings. And we're going to go to explore the data. We're going to select the Hoosier State here. So you can see all of the counties in the state of Indiana. All right, so it looks like Shelby uh, County is the county that has the highest segregation index in the state of Indiana. If there's no value, that just means that there's, there's not enough folks to come up with a statistically significant uh, index. So I would encourage you to you know, take a look and you can also look at trends. They try and keep four years at any given time. Now, the index is important because we know that people of color in communities that are highly segregated are less likely to have conditions that optimize health, also known as the social determinants, high quality education, jobs with livable wages, safe communities, um, social support and access to safe, affordable housing and reliable transportation. So now that we've reflected on the history, and I've shared some milestones with you, let's move to the current environment. Compared to other industrialized countries, we're spending more on healthcare, and our life expectancy is among the worst. You can see that we are an outlier. We are almost off the charts. We also know that minorities and vulnerable populations, such as seniors and persons with comorbidities, account for a large portion of these expenditures. Levice and his colleagues estimate that health disparities cost this country approximately $230 billion every four years, which begs us to go back to the origins. And anytime, no matter where you go in the world, when there's a population of people who have more access to opportunity, more access to those social determinants, um, you, your high quality social factors, right? You will see it play out in health status. And that is referred to as a health disparity, which is simply a measurable difference in incidence, prevalence, mortality, and burden of diseases and other adverse health conditions that exist among specific population groups. Again, you will see these differences in health outcomes when everyone does not have full access to that apple tree. You've probably heard the saying, zip code is a better predictor of health than genetic code, Many of you have seen these maps with these bubbles, um, which show life expectancy in various communities. This one is the Washington DC region. And if you drive through these communities, you'll see differences in the structural conditions. Where we live matters. 
And as medical providers, we are a subset of inequities in the broader ecosystem. And it's incumbent upon us to recognize these interactions and their impact on health and well being. We must rethink how to organize ourselves, whether it's institutionally or individually, to counteract historically entrenched forces and racialized conditions that affect health. Robert Wood Johnson and a number of funders and nonprofits are doing some great work in this space. They've invested millions of dollars to, in, in, uh, to us explore the impact of racism and discrimination on health and well being. And here are just a few narratives. I believe racism has a huge impact on mental health and depression. You're, you're out there doing your own thing, you know, trying to live your life, and then you've got someone helping go at you because you know who you are. And you know, I think later on, like I think if if it happens to you like a few times, I think it's funny. I think it has a massive you know, effect on you. And, you know, you sort of sit back you know, and you think about like, you know, why are these people having a go at me because of who I am? We're made to feel like we're not equal um, and isolated from society, and this is this come this spans from the way that the media portrays us a lot of the time negatively. So there's not a true um, uh, portrayal of who we are. Uh, I mean, you don't even see our two people on TV, mainstream TV. Yeah, mental health and racism, like, I think, to go hand in hand. Uh, it's, when you don't know if it's happening, happening to you, you still feel very bogged down, you feel heavy, you feel like that everything you do is, is is having to be a chore because you've got all these things to come up against with, as soon as you leave the house, whether it's with a taxi driver, or shop, work, it's, it's as soon as you leave that sanctuary of home, it's, um, it, yeah, it's become quite heavier. I remember I never set foot in a pub for fear of either being assaulted or being rejected at um, nightclubs. Um, You'd travel somewhere, you'd sleep in a car, you wouldn't book a motel room unless you'd have a Caucasian friend. Go and tell them the about <laughs> Having to live with that every day, it and and then and then having racism on top of that, it just it um, yeah, it just creates anxiety and it creates depression over time. Very powerful uh, narratives um, that speak to how minorities live each and every day. Uh, many minorities or people of color live each and every day with this, this sense of having to conform uh, just to, 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 to be fully accepted um, in this country. And so it does play a role on health and well being and can lead to all types of. Um, you know, psychological uh, conditions. So now I want to go into race and medicine uh, today. Um, it's important to call out how race has been pathologized. Race is a social construct, and thanks to the Human Genome Project, we know that there's more genetic variation within races than across races. Again, I'll say this. We know that there's more variation within races than across races. So we must remember that race alone, it can be a confounding variable. And epidemiologically speaking, it's important for us to contextualize morbidity and mortality from a socio-ecological lens. And this requires a lot of work and it's very complicated. And so we've just defaulted to just looking at race as a as a as a variable and because of race we make decisions and that's just not good practice. Jennifer Sai out of Ta uh, out of Brown University has done a great job in this space if you're interested in learning more um, and her focus is on how race has been taught in med school as a biological risk factor and we see these trends in med schools even today. Dorothy Roberts is a medical sociologist, and she's a national expert on this topic. I have a small clip, it's a short clip, I just want you to, to hear from her. The reason I'm so passionate 
about ending race medicine isn't just because it's bad medicine. I'm also on this mission because the way doctors practice medicine continues to promote a false and toxic view of humanity. Despite the many visionary breakthroughs in medicine we've been learning about, there's a failure of imagination when it comes to race. Would you imagine with me just a moment, what would happen if doctors stopped treating patients by race? Suppose they rejected an 18th century classification system and incorporated instead the most advanced knowledge of human genetic diversity and unity, that human beings cannot be categorized into biological races. What if instead of using race as a crude proxy for some more important factor, doctors actually investigated and addressed that more important factor? What if doctors joined the forefront of a movement to end the structural inequities caused by racism, not by genetic difference. Race medicine is bad medicine. It's poor science, and it's a false interpretation of humanity. It is more urgent than ever to finally abandon this backward legacy and to affirm our common humanity by ending the social inequalities that truly divide us. Thank you. Thank you. If you're interested in if you're interested in this topic, I would encourage you to follow uh, Dr. Roberts' work. She's a national thought leader on this particular uh, topic. In our work at Georgetown, we've conducted interviews to learn about the healthcare experiences of thousands of patients. And as a result, what we've done is we've created these, these um, profiles, these, these narratives. Our work corroborates a lot of the science around implicit bias and its impact on patients' experiences. And this is a mom who gets the impression that her doctor does not think she's very bright simply because English is not her primary language. Now we know that with training and institutional support, experiences like this can be avoided. In the late 90s, uh, Shulman and colleagues used professional actors who presented with the same symptoms for chest pain. After controlling for a number of confounding variables, the researchers found that physicians were more likely to aggressively treat white males in referring them for cardiac catheterization. In addition, so they, they treated the white males more aggressively than they did the women and um, the, the participants of color. In addition to race, there are also studies that highlight differences on how patients are treated based on their age, the type of insurance they have, and the level of, level of education that they have. These decisions, they don't typically emanate from malice or ill intent. Instead, they are manifestations of deeply embedded unconscious or implicit biases. Implicit biases are how we interpret or respond to a stimuli in a deeply unconscious manner. They are informed by our experiences and the messages that we receive from the world around us. And they're commonly manifested through body language, perceptions, behaviors, and reactions. Please note that implicit biases are not accessible through introspection. And they should not be conflated with terms, with the isms and the phobias. Implicit biases work below our level of consciousness. We are unaware that it's happening. So here's a high level overview of the science. Neuroscientists have found that at any given moment, our brains are processing an estimated 11 million pieces of information at, at any time. And we can only functionally handle about 40. So our brain seeks to conserve energy. It takes mental shortcuts and creates these pathways of association. 
which typically saves time, usually yielding reliable results. So it's not a bad thing, it's a good thing. And we know there are certain times in which our biases are more intense, such as when we are stressed, when there are time constraints, or when we are multitasking. I'm sure that's a routine moment that we all do. And over the past few decades, there's been so much that we've learned about implicit bias. One, we know that it is a normal, natural part of the human experiences, of the human experience. Our biases may not align with our declared beliefs, and we have this tendency to to gravitate towards things that we, or people that we share similar characteristics with. But guess what? We know that debiasing techniques can help us address issues when we have biases that we are not uh, happy about. I'll go into a few examples shortly. One way to assess bias is to take the IT, also known as the implicit association test. It was developed by a couple of Harvard neuroscientists. And I'll have just a quick um, demo here. There's no audio here, but I just want you to see how it works. As you can see, the test flashes images and these words pop up and you quickly make associations. It's measuring the strength of the association between concepts as well as how quickly it took you to make the decision. I've included the link to accessing the test here on slide 55. You just click on take the test and it'll take you directly to it. If you uh, just wanna Google it, just Google Project Implicit and you can take it. It's free, it only takes about five minutes. Please note, when you take the test, do not put too much thought into it. Just go with your gut instinct and make your decision. This helps optimize the reliability of your results. Upon completion, uh, you'll receive an output that looks like this. You will see your automatic preference, and, and, and for context purposes, you can see how you fare with the majority of the population who took that particular module. There are close to 10 different modules that you can choose from, including race, gender occupation, because, because uh, some we may have a tendency to associate uh, some occupations with male versus female and vice versa. Skin tone, there's one on religion, there's one on sexuality, and several more that you can choose from. I'm not going to play this clip, but I've included it uh, for you just in case you're interested in learning more about the science. This is Dr. Banaji, and she's one of the co-creators of the IAT. As we approach the last section of uh, this talk, I'd like to provide a framework because the goal is to, to leave you with some resources um, and some tools uh, to advance the work that you're doing. This framework stems from a lot of the work that we've been doing over the past 15 years. I'll dive deeper into each area, but starting with the small bubble, it's important for us to collect and analyze the right data, to work towards a workforce that reflects the populations that we serve, to assess and modify the environment of care, to mitigate risk of bias, and to build the capacity to care for the whole patient and advocate for systemic change to support these commitments. And as we do this, it's important to contextualize this work using a socio-ecological lens that takes our history into account. Institutionally, this framework can be formatted as a dashboard with indicators and metrics. So starting with data, uh, I'm, you're probably familiar with real data collection. That's data, um, collecting data by race, ethnicity, and language. And I've included the link here. Um, if you 
if you need a resource on best practices for collecting real data. It's not easy. Um, and by the way, this is becoming more and more challenging, right? Particularly as the country becomes increasingly diverse and biracial. In addition to collecting data on race, ethnicity, and language, it's important to capture location. Where do people live, particularly for the conditions we're seeing in practice most? This approach helps us determine the most appropriate community-based interventions. And again, when it comes to data collection and data analytics, given what we know about the environment and how it shapes health, it's important to collect data on social factors that drive health. We must, as a medical community, learn to deracialize disease states and instead contextualize disease states. A few years ago, the Institute of Medicine, now referred to as the National Academy of Medicine, convened a panel of experts and charged them with the task of identifying which social factors are so correlated with health outcomes that they should be incorporated in the electronic health record. Otherwise, if we standardize these factors in the EHR and develop real-time mechanisms and partnerships to address them, we can make a meaningful difference in people's lives. Some of the ones identified by the panel include assessing for food and housing insecurity, assessing for educational attainment, employment status, stress flow, exposure to violence, and social isolation, which we know is positively correlated with post-surgical readmission. But as we think about how to obtain these data from patients, I'd like to share an aha moment with you. A few years ago, we partnered with a health system, MedStar, um, which is my former employer, and we can help them with their 2018 community health needs assessment. We wanted to learn more about patients' experiences when it came to race, ethnicity, um, and exposure to discrimination, and the, uh, we wanted to identify unmet social needs. During the process, what we learned that, that many respondents were uncomfortable with these questions and many of them chose not to respond. So we were baffled by this, right? We wanted to know why. So we convened a group, so we convened several focus groups, and what we learned was that these were very personal questions and they were, they were atypical for patient care. Simply put, we, we didn't do a really good job framing and explaining why we were asking these types of questions. So as part of our learning curve, uh, it's important for us to discover the best approaches to help patients understand why we collect and why we ask these types of questions. And more importantly, we must ask ourselves, when we do have the answers, are we mobilized to take action? I'm not gonna to spend too much time on workforce diversity, but I will say that patients, they wanna see reflections of themselves in their care teams. We also know that diverse uh, teams help mitigate risk of bias and medical errors. And they're also, uh, associated with higher patient satisfaction scores. In interviews that I've had with board members and exec executives who are leading organizations that are doing some heavy lifting in the racial equity and health equity space, one theme is clear. Organizations that are serious about health equity must be explicit about their commitment and it must be internal and external. And it must, it must come from the highest ranks. And if we are serious about diversity and inclusion, these guidelines and processes, they need to be in place to normalize the commitment. This includes integrating uh, language in the mission, vision, core values, and detailing behavioral expectations and job descriptions and performance evaluations. Moving to the next domain, uh, modifying the environment of care refers to the structural conditions of, of uh, where we work. What does it look like? Solomon is another profile that we created based on the trends that we have covered by speaking to people in the community. Does the structural environment reflect the diversity and cultural richness of the communities we serve? Solomon says, I don't connect with anything in my doctor's office, from the magazines to the pamphlets to the team that cares for me. No one looks like me. Well, I will argue when you have populations who feel this way, it's going to be very difficult to engage them. Um, and we know that part, patients must be partners in the care that they're receiving. So this is a barrier for us and it should be addressed. 
Here's a picture of, of um, I really like what Brigham Young has done. Uh, here's a picture of department chair portraits that they had hanging in their hospital amphitheater. And as you can see, all of uh, the department chairs are, are white males. In an effort to modify their structural environment for a more inclusive feel, the hospital made a decision to remove the portraits. While every organization needs to assess its environment of care for inclusivity, it's extremely important for community-based organizations. When I worked for an FQHC, you know, we were in the process of we were building out a new primary care site and a vendor from another state, very unfamiliar with our community, had reached out to see if we wanted to purchase educational materials and decorative items for the wall. We said, no, thank you. Instead, we worked with a local high school art department and our walls were decorated by students' work. Reading materials were comprised of publications that reflected the lives and lived experiences of our patient population. We found music from physician, um, musicians who had ties to the community. Our goal was to build trust and create this sense of community and connection. We knew it would be key to patient engagement and improve quality metrics. This next domain is about bias. Again, the medical community is a microcosm of a world that's filled with injustices and messages around what's good, bad, pretty, ugly, evil, kind. And while each of us, we come to work each and every day striving to do our best and do the right thing, our biases can creep up on us and lead us to make decisions that we are not proud of. And as we think about bias and how to mitigate its potentially harmful effect, Growing literature is corroborating the importance of cultivating institutional cultures that value empathy and mindfulness. Listening to patients and their lived experiences is a prerequisite for high quality health care. I'll never forget about a group of patients that we interviewed from a historically marginalized community in Baltimore because we wanted to learn more about a white physician who was cherished by that community. During our interview, these patients, they didn't hone in on diagnostics and treatment protocols. Instead, what we heard was, she listens to me. She asks me what keeps me up at night. I see her in my neighborhood. She genuinely cares about me and my community. And mindfulness or being present in the moment and freeing yourself from distraction is one of the best ways to not allow biases to result in harmful decision-making. Of course, this takes practice. And there are all kinds of resources available to help you help us all grow in this area. Another intervention is a learning journey, getting out of the clinical environment and go, literally going into communities that we serve and learning about the day-to-day -day challenges that people face. This is Shanika James, a resident of Olympic Gardens in New Jersey. Her landlord uh, managed uh, the, the management company grossly neglected their responsibility of upholding um, living conditions that were up to code. These were deplorable conditions that are high, hazardous to health, and we see this quite a bit in practice. This story reminds me of some work that we did. We took some, a CEO and some senior executives, majority of them white on a shuttle. And it was a learning journey to a, his, a low income Hispanic community in Maryland. The experience was orchestrated by community activists and we had the group get off the shuttle and go into people's homes, sit on their sofas and listen to their stories. The exercise created, created many aha moments and gave these leaders a deeper appreciation for the day-to-day -day challenges that people encounter just to survive. It made them much more compassionate in how they lead and make decisions. Which takes us to the importance of creating systems with the capacity to meet the needs of the whole patient. This illustration, which I shared earlier, uh, if you focus your attention on the middle column, you will note that clinical care represents just about 20% of the factors that drive our health and, and well-being. The remaining are physical environment, social and economic factors, and health behaviors. So in translation, our health is mostly shaped by where we live, work, eat, and play. And hospitals and health systems, even pharmacies, they have a lot of data. And you'll see how heat mapping can be used to inform our work. And there's um, using this clinical data, we can we can identify census tracts or communities that have um, high rates of a disease state. 
we have to ask ourselves, what is our role as clinicians, as medical institutions? And here's two examples of how we can use do our work differently. One, I identify the assets in those communities and those red zones that you see and develop partnerships to achieve ro a more robust network of wraparound services. And we can partner with, with public health stakeholders to assess the structural conditions and advocate for change in policy, practice, or resource allocation. We also need to be sure that we have resources for patients in real time. Unbirth is a tool that providers are integrating in their systems now. Here the patient enters his or her zip code and, and selects whatever the need is. It could be housing, food, um, job training, mental health services. If you're not familiar with Aunt Bertha, please check it out. It's a national database. It's well managed and it's constantly updated. I love what this health system is doing for Medica in Ohio. It has its own food pharmacy where patients receive, receive food prescriptions from their provider. And uh, because if you know if a patient is giving medication and needs to be taken on a full stomach and they don't if they're food insecure, it really doesn't make sense to prescribe the medication. So they're really on top of this and they're doing great work in this space. And Bon Secure was in Baltimore were so fed up with an influx of preventable ERs that they decided from a large apartment complex, they just decided to partner with community-based organizations and they purchased the building. They renovated it and now they provide residents with childcare, job training, behavioral health, social support services. And the goal is for them to perceive the space as transitional housing because we want them, they want them to be homeowners. And of course, I'd be remiss not to mention medical legal partnerships. This is work we're doing at Georgetown, but we're seeing these, these partnerships all over the country where law students intervene to ensure that some of the most vulnerable patients have access to entitlement services and they're not victims of exploitation like we, uh, like Shanika. And the last domain focuses on using our voice and our institutions as vehicles for systemic change to improve the health of people of color and the conditions of historically marginalized communities. Now, how we choose this can be formal, it can be informal, but what's most important is that we're using our voice to help decision makers connect the dots across racialized policy, health outcomes, and their financial implications. I'd like to leave you with this tool. This is an assessment. Um, it includes key questions to assess organizational readiness for institutionalizing racial equity and organizational performance. You will see probing questions and the rationale for why those questions are important. So all you would do is just click here and it'll take you directly to the, uh, the tool. And on the next slide, I have questions that will help you and your organization's capacity to do work in the racial equity space at a local level. Again, I, there's questions laid out for you and then why those questions are so important. In closing, I hope this framework and the resources in the slide deck are helpful for you. And I wish the Hoosier State much success in its journey towards racial equity and health. Thank you. Dr. King, thank you so much. We greatly appreciate your time and all your support. And thanking Dr. King for a incredibly informative overview and specific and detailed tools and resources to be utilized as we can think about the context of institutional racism in healthcare and how we can build our organizations to both be aware of such biases and to prevent those from continuing forward. Thank you very much, Dr. King. Thank you.